thank you very much. Uh, great to see so many of you here. Um, I've actually got promotion this year. I came along last year, crept in the door a little bit late because I come from Cambridgeshire, and then I got given the job of running around for a mic. And then this year I got upgraded. I get to chair a session and a panel session. So my name's Martin Lyons. I, uh, I'm the chief exec of the Nature Friendly Farming Network. I come from Cambridgeshire, predominantly an arable farmer. And talking about inspiration and things we learn, I learned a lot last year and it inspires me to change our own arable farming system back into a more mixed farming system, bringing back much more livestock and listening to the inspiration we had last year. And I'm looking forward to today learning a lot more of how, does, how can we get livestock really working in our landscape to live that multifunctional uh, delivery. Um, so the Nature Friendly Farming Network is free for farmers to join. If, we've got to stand over there. If you want any information, it's over there. It's about giving farmers a voice. Farmers are inspirational to me. They have so much uh, opportunity to do amazing things and tackle many of the problems we have around climate, biodiversity, healthy food production, and we want to help give those farmers the voice and, and encourage governments and supply chains to do the right thing, but also share knowledge and exchange, and these events are critical for that, for that opportunity to share stuff. We've all got stuff we can teach and help other, each other. So I look forward to today. Um, I look forward to chairing this uh, session. First, we're going to welcome up Sarah, and then we're going to welcome up Matt, and then afterwards, there'll be a QA. and a So if you've got any questions, save them until after the, we've had the speakers, and then we can do a left and right and throw the questions at them. If, however hard you want to do them, really up for that. Really dig into some details and make them sweat a bit. That'd be really good. So if, without further ado, I look forward to welcoming Sarah. Morning. Uh, so far, they've made it sound a little bit like a sort of cult forward slash orgy, so I'm a bit nervous. But all the emotions and sharing and going up to people you don't know. But um, I'm just here to talk about, well, talking about farming outside of the bubble that we can sometimes end up in in this exciting movement that we're all part of. And if you had told me, I guess, maybe six years ago that I would be on a stage with a lot of hay bales and collie dogs and people in check shirts in front of me, I would have thought it would be odd because for uh, 10 years beforehand, I mostly looked like this. I was a criminal and family barrister. I traveled all over the country representing mostly people who had done very bad things or were accused of doing very bad things and parents whose children were being removed by the state. And then, as life tends to do, I was thrown three quasi-unexpected wildcards, one of which uh, was having babies, which I admit was, you know, not entirely unexpected, but they're really hard to take to court with you, it turns out. So that put an end to my court-based career temporarily. And when I was pregnant with my second son, I got a book deal, which is the one uh, you can see here in your defense, which was to write the human stories of a world that very few people understood, even though it impacted their lives every day. You can see where I'm gonna go with the farming one. But as when I was writing that, my husband lost his job, and we found ourselves with an eight-month-old, a two-and-a-half-year-old, a deadline and a bit of advance that I'd already spent, so uh, I had to finish the book, and a decision about what to do. We had just bought our first family house in London, but it was completely dilapidated, we couldn't live in it. So we thought we would get out of town and go to Suffolk, which is where Ben grew up. And so we moved to a cottage in the middle of mid-Suffolk, the kind of uncool bit, not near the coast, and rented a cottage which looked over uh, 50 acres of pasture, which belonged to his parents, the house that he grew up in was on the other side of that. And uh, his dad had recently realized the long-held dream of becoming a farmer at the age of 81 by buying 180 acres of arable nearby. And we, with the magnificent confidence that comes from total naivety, said, we can, we'll manage it. We're basically unemployed. We... Uh, feel like how hard can it be and I think there was obviously part of that which was wanting to do something which felt much more real than this world that we had just left but in London every third Guardian article tells you that if you're in charge of land you should probably rewild it and save the world so 
we were left with a decision and a journey about what we should responsibly do with the land that we now found ourselves uh, in charge of. And it is grade two Suffolk land. It's Suffolk clay. It's productive land. So the idea of turning it all over to shrub was not hugely appealing. And so I began this quest to try and find out what the options were. And I tipped and fell down this rabbit hole of learning into a quiet revolution that at that time, 2017, 2018, was just starting to take shape all around the country, a regenerative farming revolution. Now, this world was not entirely unfamiliar to me because I had grown up on the other side of the country in Hampshire as the granddaughter of tenant farmers. So my grandparents down in the bottom right-hand corner, they took on their farm tenancy five years after wartime rationing ended in a country that absolutely remembered what it was like to be hungry. And over the course of their tenancy, they really lived through the modern parable of farming life. There's my mum driving a corn cart in flares and in a bikini because it was the 1970s and you should never miss an opportunity to tan. <laughs> so I thought, how had we gone from a place where my grandfather, who when he died, was absolutely sure of his place in the world, which was a hero feeding a hungry nation, to the place that we now found ourselves in in Suffolk, where farmers seem to be blamed for all the ecological ills of the world. And so in order to figure out where we were going, I, had to, I realized that we had to, and I had to understand where we had come from, the context in which it sat. And so I took out my grandfather's diaries, who had written a diary every day, only five lines, but every day from 1939, when the war started, to 2008. I had been told that they were only about the weather. And there was, a, there was a lot about the weather. There was a lot about the weather. But within the weather, and if anyone can tell me what on earth he was doing with the primroses, I'd be all ears if you're close enough to see that. But what I realized that along with all the weather, there was the language of modern farming changing and the speed with which it had changed. And so as I was reading through these diaries, I started to pick out words, and then I put them together in something that if I'm feeling really pretentious, I call a poem. And so I thought I would start this morning by reading you this. Shocking, thrashing, carting, bagging, morning milking, straw for thatching, cutting thistles, rolling barley, corn rick, straw rick, re-shocking fallen oats, Drilling, harrowing, cultivating, ploughing, all day tater picking, hedge laying, per pulling bushes, burning cooch, trimming nettles, grow more committee meeting. Red clover, white clover, lucerne, sandfoin, hoeing sugar beet, blackberry picking, afternoon burning bushes. All hands roguing wheat, 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 all hands roguing wheat. Sunday. Roging corn, 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 finish roging corn. Weather dull. Drilling barley, creosoting, buckwheat, evening burning stubble, hedge trimming, subsoiling, top dressing winter wheat, broadcasting red clover in barley, year one lay, first load bulk fertilizer in. Calf pens, sowing rape, spraying, afternoon picking slows, loading, stacking, disking, worming, rotivating headland strips, feeding bullocks, rabbit shooting, roguing black grass, combining wheat, combining wheat, combining wheat. All day in dryer doing oilseed rape, all day in dryer doing oilseed rape, all day in dryer doing oilseed rape, all day in dryer doing oilseed rape. Start silage. Fencing, drilling, bagging up, ICI on beans, nitrogen on rape, plow rape stubble, all day combining. Afternoon to Allsford show. <laughs> yeah. 
he was on an old-fashioned three-generation tenancy, and so when my uncle was 23, he took on that tenancy, but in a world which was very different. In 1984, the consequences of intensive food production were starting to make themselves felt. A word that had never been heard by my grandfather in this context, the environment, began to crop up in policy papers. And soon enough, my uncle found himself being paid not to farm thanks to the wine lakes, grain mountains, and vast industrial overproduction. Unlike most farmers, rather than having the pub to complain about it in, he had a column in twen for 25 years in Farmers Weekly where he complained about it. Here he is, looking large and ginger and angry. <laughs> here are some of my favorite headlines. And here is something he wrote after a particularly heated conversation that we had about soil, where he wrote, somehow, having 36 years of hands-on farming experience and a respectable agricultural engineering degree, which included some proper technical soil science, taught by proper, if barking mad, soil scientists, is trumped by reading The Guardian, watching Country File, and harvesting echo chamber opinions at SW1 Twatterati dinner parties. <laughs> He is not totally wrong. <laughs> and so I thought, who's right? And if my grandfather saw himself as the hero and my uncle thinks that he is perceived as the villain, what is the next generation going to define themselves by? So I went to try and find out. And I discovered farmers, some first-generation farmers, some like Ollie here, whose own dad had sold his farm in the 90s because he had to, because he was a uh, dairy that had been taken out in the 90s, who'd found their way back to farming. And they couldn't afford to get into the kind of farming that they saw around them, large-scale intensive farming. Hello. <laughs> Not for me, no? <laughs> and I found farmers who were working with nature-based solutions which were making them more money because the money that they made with the produce they sell when sold went into their own pocket and not bears. I saw how farms were integrating livestock back into the rotations, not just in the way that I saw in the fields around me, but through mob grazing, through pasture poultry. And I saw people experimenting with things like pasture cropping, welding, my friend Ginge in the hat, who took the motor from a windscreen wiper to put weld on the machine to try out pasture cropping in his field. And I realized that this job, which is so undervalued, without which none of us would have any food, was not only an intellectual job, but a highly creative and adaptive job. And I don't think that many people outside that world understood that. So the other unexpected part of this journey was that it changed the way that I saw. That's our hedge. Once I would have looked at that hedge and thought that it was nice and tidy. Now I look at it and I see all the winter bird food that's been cut off it, all the uh, caterpillar eggs, butterflies that, be, that have been cut off it that will no longer hatch. I see a flat top, which means that anything nests in there is vulnerable to predators. I no longer look at the wheat field in the top right-hand corner and think that it looks nice and tidy. I think how bare it looks. And I think when I look at those two pictures in the middle, how obvious it is that what we are doing to the soil has made it, despite all the fertilizers we were using, and sprays so depleted that it couldn't even grow anything in a large swathe of the headland. And I look at the tree, the oak, the old oak, in the middle of the field, and rather than thinking, that's nice they left an oak there, I think once there would have been a hedge which joined it all up because it ran along old Bronze Age lines. And so we started trying to integrate some of the things we'd learned into our own farm, replanting the hedges, being paid by public money, which however many decades earlier had used public money to have them taken out. We started integrating uh, livestock back into the ro our rotation. Those are some red pole cattle. It's my youngest son trying to plan out a hedge. 
And I also started realizing that so many of these methods and so much of this philosophy was all old news. Eve Balfour wrote The Living Soil in 1943. She knew, they knew that the soil was alive. We just forgot it because we hadn't needed to remember. And that applied to the flowers that I saw coming up, all of which my grandmother would have taught me the names of. And I hadn't remembered because I hadn't needed to. And because I hadn't needed to, I stopped being able to see they were even there. It also changed uh, how we in interacted and what we saw. So here are my <laughs> quite feral, admittedly, kids looking for dung beetles. I promise they washed their hands afterwards, I think. And a really awful failed pasture cropping experiment that we did because the um, crimson clover was too high and it, it subsumed it. But down there on the bottom right-hand side, on the left is... Uh, well, let me, on the right, where the circle is, is a wheat root where I realized that the clover, ha, clover root had basically welded itself onto the wheat root, and the nodule was pink, so it was fixing nitrogen. The two plants wanted to work together. And I realized how fast this recovery happens if you let it, like a farmer friend of mine who calls it crikey farming, because he keeps going, crikey, I didn't expect that. But I also realized that it wasn't necessarily just about the recovery of our land, which had been intensively farmed for multiple decades because it was owned by a company, not a person beforehand, so they just cared about the BPS check and not about the natural capital of it. I realized also that it began to connect all the people around us. So this chair belongs to Mr. Pink, who lives in the cottage at the bottom of that uh, lane. Mr. Pink has been on his way to meet his maker, as he describes it, for some time. And that headland is after oilseed rape came off it. It was, nothing really grew. So we planted a massive owl of winter bird food. And Mr. Pink, to begin with, just came up with himself and his dog. But over the last year, now comes up with his daughter and two pairs of binoculars. And they sit there together and watch all the bird life, which has now returned to it. I get people in the village who stop me, and it is usually the woman, who says that tells me that she thinks our land smells different, which I can't think of a better compliment, genuinely, than that. It changed how everyone else saw our land, as well as us. And so, when my literary agent, who is so urban that she says that when she leaves London, she puts her head out of the train window to try and get the last bit of smog before she goes to the clean air, <laughs> she, had tra she was extremely keen on me writing a very lucrative, best-selling crime fiction series, which I had begun. And then I had to sit her down and break it to her that I didn't want to write about people being murdered. I wanted to write about this world that I had found myself in, which was so much more than how we produce our food. And to begin with, she literally held her arms up and across and said, absolutely no way, that is so boring. No one's going to read that. And I said, but the thing is, Nell, it's not just about what's on our plates. It's about how we solve these vast poly crises, climate change, mental health, physical health, a community fragmentation. Farming has the possibility, the potential, to solve so many of these, whilst enabling our own relationship with land to heal in the process. So I wore her down, and she let me write Rooted. And I thought I would end by, I guess, giving you a very brief reading which summarizes the point in the book that I wanted to make to all of the people who might never set foot in a field, to all of the people who might pick it up because of the cover or because it was a memoir, rather than the fact that they were farmers. But I am starting to realize that while farming has always been about care of the land, stewardship, and husbandry, the truth is that for all the trees and bees, we still need farmers to grow our food. With supply chains threatened by politics, pandemics, and climate change, this food needs to be as local to us as possible. But in a world where microplastics produced by fossil fuels can be found atop the highest mountain and in the deepest sea trenches, 
We need farmers to grow our fiber too. We need them to grow our trees and hedgerows and plants, not just for wood, but also to clean our air and provide homes for some of the creatures that form part of our ecosystem. We need farmers to create habitats for insects, for they are at the bottom of the food chain and support the rest of life and therefore us. We need them to grow flowers for pollinators because over a third of the world's crops depend upon them. We need them to maintain soil full of fungi and microbacterial life because these tiny living things now turn out to be critical for so much of the way our world works, some think even for the weather. But there is something else we need our farmers for, something that is both intangible and unsellable and which stitches together the fabric of communities with a thread that goes back hundreds of years, sewing our future to our past. We need them to remain the cornerstones of our countryside for all who live and work and visit there. We need someone to remember how to lay a hedge or a dry stone wall and to leave a hog hole for sheep and small children to escape through. We need someone to push the snowplow in winter and wield the chainsaw after an autumn storm. We need someone to stand in the pulpit at the funeral of the last of a generation and tell the story of what it is to lead a quiet and useful life to a congregation with swimming eyes. We need someone to remember the old names and the old ways and teach them to us so that we can know them too because they rarely find their ways into textbooks or agricultural universities. I'm starting to think that maybe it is not so much that the definition of farming is changing, but that it is reverting. Is a farmer actually someone who uses their land to provide what their community needs? Food, fiber, and fuel, but also oxygen, ecosystems, clean water, and soil that is biologically alive enough to work with, to work with plants and grazing animals to lock up carbon and cool the planet for us. And is a farmer not also someone who can care for the land so that those who are able might leave the gray concrete of the city behind for a moment, stand on a hillside, and feel their hearts tighten as they remember that the world, and much within it, is truly extraordinary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, I think what you put in your book and the way you express things touched many hearts and actually captures the essence of, of many of us. We're so lucky to live and work on farms and see the, the change in seasons and everything else and the change of approach that we're all here to learn and, and look at doing different ways where we connect with uh, nature, with soils, with livestock and get the whole system working. So next we're going to uh, introduce Matt and uh, hear a bit more about his story. And uh, so over to you. Thank yeah, you. Lovely. Hello, everyone. It's really exciting to be here. I've, um, I don't know, I've, I've been a massive fan of, of both the Renos for ages, and I feel to be invited to this space, which is like, well, I thought we were like, we were like the north of North Wales, and I thought that well, after a while, I don't leave Wales very often, you feel like you're at the top, don't you? And then yesterday I came out and we kind of came around the corner and like, whoa, there's, there's another long way to go. <laughs> so, so, hello, you real northerners. Um, <laughs> Yeah, this is, I also, well, this is us. So we're a small 80-acre farm between the mountains and the sea in northwest Wales. Um, and we've been there for 11 years. And we kind of feel like we've kind of somehow, we've just landed at the right place in the right time. It's a bit like being here, isn't it? Like, I feel like it's a really exciting time to be alive. Like, I think we're at the point of, like, a really crucial point in the history of humanity. And I feel like we're in, particularly farmers, we're in this really, I don't know, really capable, kind of honored place to be able to do something about some of the problems in the world. Anyway, so this is us. And we're on a, on a mission. We kind of came with a question. So we kind of set out, actually, we kind of came to North Wales to grow babies and cabbages. And I wanted to learn every bird's nest. But actually, we also really wanted to be farmers. and. We had this question of, is it possible to buy a small farm on a mortgage to make it pay its way through producing real nutrient-dense food 
And at the same time, to build soil, to build biodiversity, to build social capital, and I think most importantly, to enjoy it. And I think somehow that always gets missed off the end of that little regenerative little, you know, little point set. And, and if we can do that, that's great for us, but actually if we can convince other people that you can do that, that's, that's hopefully quite powerful. Because actually, I think believing that humans can be useful and beneficial in an ecosystem is absolutely crucial to the future of everything. And, and so that question has been kind of a kind of core part of that. And, and I think... Um, like, people get really stuck, don't we, on, like, even farmers and even politicians, like, they don't believe that eating can be, everyone thinks eating can be an ecologically negative thing to do. Um, and it's, I just, I want to kind of challenge this thing of, is it possible to make the world better every time we, every time we eat? And I think it, 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 means, it means a shift away from sustainable and sustainability. And I'm in no way knocking all those people that have done amazing things under the banner of sustainability. But like, if I go home and I ask my wife how our relationship is, and she goes, oh, it's sustainable. Like, like, <laughs> like that's pretty close to a disaster, isn't it? <laughs> and, like, and I think that seems to be like what we're aiming for in so much of our farming systems, you know? So I want something that gets better all the time. And there's a pattern that actually, if you work with nature, if you work with ecology, you realize really quickly that basically... There's no such thing as constant, is there? Things either get better, you're either in a positive spiral or you're in a negative spiral. There's no such thing as staying the same. Um, and so aiming to be in that positive spiral is like really important, isn't it? And I think in a way we're like, we kind of issued the little set of, this is a terrible thing, but it's a terrible metaphor, but like we kind of issued the set of credit cards at birth, you know? And so you've got a little set of these cards and, and people get obsessed by the financial card you've got, you know? But actually, you've also got your own health. You've also got that relationship with, with others. You've got that social card. And then we've all got, even consumers, you know, we've got, a, we've got a soil card and we've got a biodiversity card. And if you're a farmer, you're kind of lucky because you've kind of got a bigger, you know, you've got a bigger credit limit and a bigger responsibility with that, with that kind of set of cards. And I think it's, it's just a really important way to think about things. Now, You'll be able to tell from all this guff that I've not always been a farmer. So um, I grew up, and I was desperate to be. And I, but I grew up in a town. I grew up in a terrace house um, in, in Yorkshire. Um, and my parents were like just such a disappointment to me that they couldn't have cared less about farming. Um, and I fell in love with this guy instead. And this is John Seymour. And, and like, I spent all my childhood like, trying to like, secretly hatch out chickens under my bed. And, and I built a plow for my sister so we could plow the garden. And, you know, all these things that, that are essential if you're going to be a farmer. And, and, and my parents were like so patient. Our neighbors less so. But I, anyway, I realized I couldn't be a farmer. And I went off and I became an ecologist. Um, and I became a filmmaker. And I started making programs like Coast and Country File, things like that. And I really quickly jumped into kind of taking that ecology further. And I started making programs like Planet Earth and Life. And I spent a lot of time on a series called Frozen Planet. And when I did that, I got to spend, I don't know, like maybe 12, 13 years of my life just sat in some of the world's most pristine ecosystems, you know? And I just got to sit and... And it's not like any other job being a filmmaker, because actually you, you genuinely have time just to stop and observe and to watch. And when you're doing that, you, you kind of start to see ways that... Maybe there's ways that humans could interact with these ecosystems in a different way to the way we do. And, but anyway, I did that for quite a long time, but I kept on getting... Like, I basically spent, you know, years living at minus 20, living in helicopters and, and all this kind of stuff, and I kept on nearly dying. Like, there's this little edge of the BBC where, like, they just, like, they go, well, look, that's not possible to do a health and risk assessment for that. So you just go and get on with it, you know? <laughs> and I got to this point, and I was, like, I was buy buying, like, bits of shotguns behind, you know, behind supermarkets in Canada, and I was, like, a nearly killed so many times by polar bears, I can't tell you, and, and all these things. And, and every time it happened, I'd phone, I'd phone my now, now wife, Jenny, and I'd be like, I nearly died today. And she'd be like, well, that's stupid. I don't want to go out with somebody who's nearly died. And, I'm like, and all I wanted was like a little hug, you know, and be told it's all right. But you can't have arguments at eight pounds a minute on a satellite phone. This is one thing. <laughs> it's like the worst way to argue ever. Um, 
And so I realized we had to become more domesticated. And so we came home, and we quit the BBC, and we went round, round Wales. We'd fallen in love with Wales. And we went round Wales looking for someone. We kind of wanted, like, you know, like six acres and three walls. And that's kind of what we could afford. And then we found Hemban, and we, like, fell completely in love with this place. But then, luckily, we met this guy in a, in a pub in Bristol. And he, we didn't have any money, really. And he was like, I tell you what, I'm really good at borrowing money. So you seem like you're quite... <laughs> You seem like you're quite excited people. You seem like you're reasonably clever. You just tell me how much you want, and I'll, just, I'll do the talking, but we'll just work it out. And so we did. And so all of a sudden, we'd gone from like having two reasonable jobs, two reasonable salaries, to having a massive debt and the 80 acres of this little corner of Wales. And becoming a farmer is a really interesting career choice, isn't it? Because it's got some of the highest rates of suicide. It's got some of the lowest rates of pay. It can be one of the loneliest jobs ever. So we had to come in with this kind of, you know, this kind of fresh mindset. And actually, I was so lucky, I finally realized, to have a dad who didn't have a clue about farming. Because all of a sudden, we could just, we could make up our own rules as we went along. Um, and that was really using the fact that we were ecologists. And where ecology meets farming, at least it's what I used to think, is where you kind of get permaculture. And... It's all sorts of different things to different people. But to me, it's all about just looking at pattern language and looking at natural patterns. And if you think about a woodland, you know, there's like, there's a huge cycle of life, isn't it, that goes on within a woodland. But yet it's got tiny inputs, you know, it's got a bit of rain, it's got a bit of bird poo, it's got a bit of volcanic dust every five years, you know. But for that, there's a huge amount of life that takes place. And so I just love the idea of applying that to a human kind of centric ecosystem, to a farm. And I got a bit obsessed by this saying, right? So the only limit to a farmer's productivity is the farmer's imagination, right? That is a really dangerous phrase to take on a farm. Um, and really quickly, we realized why, we realized why conventional's conventional. You know, there's a reason people do things the way they do. Um, and I, and we quickly, we were very close to getting our knickers in this big kind of, you know, polycultural, multi-layered like twist. Um, and then I found, I realized it's all about decision making, isn't it? And I actually, I think the biggest barrier to that more beautiful world that we all know can exist is just good decision making. And I was lucky enough then that I got into holistic decision making. And I'm not going to go into this, but really simply, it's all just about working out what you really, really want out of life and then making it come true. And so, you know, you work out what you really want, you work out where you are, you make decisions that take you there. And then the good bit about holistic decision-making is it comes from a military background. And it's all about... Mm, it's all about when things... Things always in nature, they're always trying to self-correct, aren't they? They're always trying to fix themselves. It's a bit like trying to have a conference of farmers and try to tell them where to be and when to be and, you know, where to get a cup of tea from. Like, they just make it up all themselves as you go along. And all you can do is just kind of course-correct. And that's what holistic decision-making is. And I... We found it really powerful. So, with that looking at ecological patterns, with that holistic decision-making, where do you end up? Well, you end up going back to those core patterns, don't you? And to us, with a farm, like the, that core pattern really is that savanna ecosystem. I'm not going to go into this, because you all know loads about this, but that kind of core idea of, you know, you've got 20 30% tree canopy cover, you've got grass that gets to really, really express itself, and then a couple of times a year, maybe once, twice, it actually gets really hit hard by a big, dense herd of ruminants, right? So that pattern's kind of core. But, you know, that looks a bit kind of hot and sweaty, doesn't it, for, for Wales and maybe for Cumbria? <laughs> so we've got a kind of different thing going on. We used to have these big, like, mosaic woodlands, you know, that were big, patchy, patchy areas. And I think if you went back in time, if you go back 4,000 years, 10,000 years, I don't really know, but something like that, that would have been the place to hang out is that woodland edge, you know? And it's the place where you get the, where you get the fruit and the, you, know, you get the bramble and the nut and the apple and the pear. You get all these things and you get all the fungi in these spaces. It's the place to be. And so, you know, from having not a, no real kind of thing saying you can and can't, then we decided to divide as, create as much of that as possible across the whole farm. Um, and this is actually a slightly outdated map, but what we've done is we've taken the, the kind of core part of our main grazing pasture and we've divided that up into about 42 day-sized grazing units. Um, and that's all done by... So on our poorer land, it's divided up with um, 
like things for browse or things for biomass. We've got wood chip stuff. We've got stuff for browse. And then our better land, we've got stuff that's, well, this is quite an old picture now, but we've got stuff with fruit and nuts and things like that and kind of substory layers. And it just gives us this amazing structure for the whole farm. And then, this is a bit cheesy now, isn't it? But like what would follow that is, is those birds. It's those little insect-eating birds. And I'm worried what Claire's going to say about my dung beetle population when, when I'm always following my cows around with this like little herd of predators, you know, that are taking all those beetles. But, but we follow that round. So <laughs> we've got about 20 cattle that do that rotation. And then we've got 300 egg-laying hens that follow that, follow that cattle herd around about half the farm. They can't cover the whole thing. Um, and... They get organic food. We move Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And it just it's a really solid part of the farm, actually. It's a really, we're really keen on feeding our community. You know, like a big part of our context is to feed our local community real food. Um, and so actually, the chickens and the eggs, and yeah, we're importing a lot of food. But actually, it's a, it, I don't know, it's a kind of like it's the best eggs that I can get to my community within the context we're in. Um, and then you can't just live on, on beef and eggs alone. I try a little bit. But you also need vegetables. And so we've also got this no-dig market garden that's at the heart of the farm. Um, and what's really exciting about the market garden is we've got a, a piece of land, and it's less than an acre, right? It's slightly north-facing. You can see the mountains. You can see the sea. Like, in all different dimensions, this is like a terrible idea, you know, to try and grow vegetables here. But it really works. And so from that, from that acre of land, we can feed 80 families most of their vegetables most of the year. And it's, it's done by really working with soil. So it's all no dig, and it's all really organized. Like, it's all, but it's basically, it's like a lived-out spreadsheet on the ground. Um, and so, you know, we never have a bed that's empty for more than, more than a two or days or something like that for most of the year. All that garden is constantly working. <coughs> and... When we first came, I was like, oh, we're going to be farmers, and farmers produce food. And my wife was like, that's great, Matt, but we've also got this massive mortgage. Um, and, so, and so we did have to do something else to make a little bit of income on the farm. And so we started bringing in tourists, and I had discovered, actually, that I love building weird little things. And so we've got this little range of these little, little hobbit houses and stuff like this on the farm. And... Um, but what's been interesting about this is I think it's actually the most important thing we do. Because, like, we're really lucky that my kids, and part of the reason we do it, and your kids on farms, like, they're so lucky to have that, like, Arthur Ransom, like, Swallows and Amazons thing going on, you know? And I wanted to better give that to other people. So people coming in the farm, they can come and pick some veg, and they can go and get lost in the woods. And they can, like, we've got no chance unless people connect to nature. And unless people wake up and hear that dawn chorus... You know, I think it's a really fundamental part of our future. So actually, I now really enjoy the tourism side, and I think it's probably one of the most valuable things we do. Now, this all makes me look really busy, doesn't it? Which I am. But we've got a secret weapon, which is child labor. And <laughs> no, is it? But actually, it's all about people on farm. And I think this is what I've realized. Is the more I look back at like, the history of agriculture and where it went a bit wrong, like, it's been going wrong for a long time. Like, there's Plato quotes about destroying ecosystems, you know? And I'm pretty sure Plato ate grass-fed beef and organic vegetables. But I, there's some point about the clearances when I think that kind of going wrong kind of sped up a little bit. And I think getting people back onto farm is really, really important. And so there's me and my wife, and then there's three others that take a salary out of the farm. Um, but then we've also got a team of interns that come along. And... It's just, it's a brilliant form of, of just energy and passion. Like we have this group of mainly young people come along and we teach them a lot. So we run a lot of courses on the farm. And so they basically they get access to that education. And the idea is by the time they leave, they could kind of, if they haven't seen through it, run a little hen band of their own. And that's that kind of premise to it. Um, and I used to worry about people coming into this space and like, what are these volunteers going to do? And does it really work? But actually now, there's a huge demand. Like the demand for people who are ecologically literate, who know, a farm, know how a farm works and are kind of farm smart, the demand for those people is now huge. And I think it's about to really, really mushroom. Um, I was going to tell you about all the ways it goes wrong, but Martin's just told me that I'm about to run out of time, so it's all perfect. No, I... <laughs> 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 um, no, I... 
it's not all worked all the time, but, um, but in general, the pattern is working. And, and I won't go into that, I'll skip him out. And I've recently got into this space of like agri-wilding. I got, because I'm an ecologist, I got for briefly, and forgive me for this, I got really excited by rewilding. And I went off and I like secretly became a director of one of these charities and I, I you know, and I, and I, I well, it's just it's a really interesting space. But then you go more into it and you're like, well, wait a minute. I started talking to these lawyers and these lawyers are going, well, so what we need to do is we need to have farms and we need to have nature and we need ways of legally keeping people out of nature. And this scared the life out of me. And I stepped really back quite quickly, actually, from some of that rewilding space. And... I'm not going to go into it. But I, I've got a little thing about, like, basically, it's going to be fine. Because actually what we can do is I know from our farm that you can have these little, these little scruffy woodland glade-based systems that can produce far more food than the, our farm would have ever done before. And it can do so in a way that has people in it, in a way that provides just better food than it ever has. It's all super possible. And the one thing that makes me really excited is I think it's really easy for other people to do the same thing. And, like, we're a nation. Uh, we're good at growing grass, right? We're not perfect, and I know we all know that there's quite a lot of them are getting it quite wrong. But, like, we're pretty good at it. And we know what a cow is supposed to look like. And we've got rural, almost functional communities. And I just think, like... We've, we're only a few tweaks away from having a system where humans can genuinely be a positive part of an ecosystem again. Um, and that's what I'm excited about. Thank you very much. Thanks very, thanks very much, Matt. Uh, and, and sorry you haven't got a chance to cover the thing. Hopefully lots of questions will cover some of what you didn't get a chance to talk about. My takeaway bit was it makes the comp farm look more complicated but engaging people into what we do and the community, what we can do is so much better. And just hearing your story of how, how you connected and uh, make it work. And just to touch on the wilding bit, um, we need a wilder landscape. We need bigger bushy hedges, bigger trees and anything else. But it needs to be farmed in a, in a kind and gentle way. And we need livestock in there and we need crops and food in there and we need people in there. So don't too worry too much about the rewilding agenda because we still need people in there managing it and that's us farmers. So let's do some Q&A. If you put your hands up, there's going to be some roaming mics. I'm going to try and do a left and a right and then we're going to join over here. Hello. Um, do you see private finance as a positive or a negative impact on the kind of involvement you guys have got? Uh, I think it's not only positive, I think it's going to be essential. I'm, we're, I'm on a steering committee for a local cluster group that I've just set up in our part of the world, which has got a real mix of people on it. And we've had one, and we're going to have another conversation with Anglia Water, because we've been turned down for government uh, facilitation funding with a letter that had two spelling mistakes and a made-up species in it. But that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> but um, if you mean private finance in terms of kind of private in the private sector, that's a... I mean, Anglia Water have a vast reputation problem going on. They've already had multiple billion dollar fines, million dollar fines, uh, and been hauled up by the Advertising Standards Authority for saying everything was great when it absolutely wasn't. And they know that farmers in their part of the world can do a huge amount of their job for them because we can clean the water so they don't have to take the nitrates out afterwards. So that uh, is a really small example of where private finance is funding something that probably wouldn't have happened otherwise, our cluster. Um, but I think, I realize it's a bit of a, I mean, it's been a while, it's been called a Wild West for years now. Uh, but I had a m big meeting on Tuesday with various uh, people like HSBC and Waitrose and all these other people. And the, I think the question in that room was not if it should happen, but how, how you measure it. That's the tricky bit at the moment, how you measure it to then monetize it. But yes, I, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about the potential for private finance if we can make sure that the lawyers do their job right and make it watertight. Yeah, 
Yeah, no, I, I think I think I think all all hands on deck, really. And and I'm a big believer in. I don't think there's such thing as like. I'm really scared when you get like a them and us thing going on as well. And I'm really I'm really into like you know everybody. I don't know like everyone's got you know a partner or a place in nature or a you know a grandchild that they love. And I think actually, the more we just go look, we're all in this together. And I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying that's easy with some of these big companies, but actually, somewhere in that board of directors, everyone's got that love of something. And I think we're all in here together. And yeah, I just think, I think the spending it and how you do it and the caution over, you know, powers owning things, which maybe bias things going forwards is a bit scary and is really interesting. But I think, I think, yeah, I think all in. Can I just add one thing to that, which I could not agree more on. And there's nothing like defending, um, you know, really awful people for 10 years to teach you that it's not just this, it's not as simple as villains and heroes. Of course it's not. And I think I could not agree more with the way that you reach people is through the connection that they will have at some point in their life, even if it's back to their childhood, with this world and trigger that part of them. I mean, I met the sustainability officer, for, uh, sustainability officer for Nestle the other day. He used to work for Fairtrade. I mean, that's his background. It's so just because he's been given this badge, which has got so many negative connotations, it doesn't make him who he is. And that, I think, is going to be the kind of gateway into this. Thanks very much. And using that analogy around... Uh villains becoming heroes we know they can do but we've got to engage with them and, and encourage them so we need to break those barriers down and enter that space there were some figures i was involved with this week in, on, in a meeting uh cut farm, england farmers currently get about 2.4 billion pounds we currently need about 28 billion pounds coming into the system to fix all the things that are going wrong and that's not going to come from all from government so we all need to chip in and all anyone who wants something from our landscape we need them to contribute towards it and it's complicated, but we need to have those conversations. So another hand then, please. One right at the front here. Just before I ask, is there another question, then we get Mike lined up? Another hand? Yep, so we can head that way. So yours next. Uh, just following on from the private finance thing, <clears throat> one thing I think people are doing wrong is not, not showing what they've done, monitoring baselines to start with and seeing the direction of travel. And you've got to show that direction of travel in order to get the funding. So how have you stored your memory of what you've done and what's happened as a result of that? Um, I wouldn't say we've done it perfectly. We've, we did, about last year, I had a big panic that actually Hembank was changing quite fast. Um, and we went and actually got some surveys done on our neighboring, neighboring farm to us which is far from perfect, but actually it had the same treatment for all its history. And so we got quite a solid baseline from that. And, and we've been doing all sorts of weird and wonderful things, which I think are now quite formalised. Um, but, you know, I've started doing like weird, like I go and record the bird song, you know, I record the dawn choruses and all these things that are probably completely incomparable. But I, it's something which we should all be doing. And we've just, I didn't talk about it in the thing, but actually we've just had the, the mountain behind our house came up for sale. And I wrote this little thing to the Wildlife Trust going, hey, look, do you want to buy this mountain? I'll farm it. And I thought that was it. And then three days later, this lady turned up and said, oh, all right, show us this mountain. And they've now bought it. <laughs> um, so actually, it's this huge, it's for, on our scale, it's quite a big demonstration option for it to go, actually, let's apply this technique here. And they've got, you know, they've got millions of, like, little old people that know every beetle. So I'm really excited about them. That swarm landing on our farm as well. Uh, we did our local wildlife trust just before we converted to organic. So we've just gone through our conversion process. Uh, our first organic crop is this year, and then we did the pastures the year before. So we got a baseline from our local wildlife trust, but we had to pay for it ourselves, and it is not cheap. And that was, um, yeah, like four years ago. And we've been doing soil organic carbon testing, sending it off to SO1 and so on. But I have not, you know, I have not signed anything. I'm not selling any of it. And that, is, and I have been doing a lot of reading about it and talking to a lot of people, and it shows you that I'm not, I'm not confident that I'm at a stage where I properly understand it well enough to read an agreement and put my name on the dotted line. But that's because I still feel like it's a moving feast a bit. 
And I know that there are farmers who've locked themselves into 30-year carbon contracts. There are. Uh, but I think that type of model might change. <laughs> there was a, I've been talking to this incredibly terrifying Austrian financier this week. And she was like, I don't understand. Why do you do it like a phone contract? Like five years rolling and then you're like, come out if you have to come. I was like, oh, that's a really good idea. I don't know why anyone does that. <laughs> but uh, so, yeah, I mean, everyone says baseline, baseline, baseline measure. You can't, you can't manage until you measure. But I do think it's really expensive to do it. And there are the beginnings of processes where you, as part of the SFI or maybe something like that, where you can get funding to measure it. And I think, personally, I believe that, super cl that, that clusters are going to be our superpower. Because if you're able to spread your costs over thousands of hectares, as opposed to one fairly small farm, it will be cheaper. Uh, so that's what we've done. We haven't done anything with it, but that's what we've done. So I'd really recommend collect any data you can, baseline with what you've got. We don't know what the baseline measurements will be yet, but if you can collect anything, and if you're into soil, put it in a jar and put it on a shelf and come back and look at it in five years' time, comparing what you've got. Some of the mistakes I felt on my farm, we hadn't taken some of that soil samples and other things and held it as a record, because you don't see the change then, and it's fascinating. And I'll see you on other farms what we can do. Um, but yeah, just collect some data, because then you've got something you can reference back to. So there's another question at the back there. Yeah, can I? Just before you put your hand up, next question oh. after that one. Anyone want to hand out? There you are. Is it? Right. There you got the last. This, that one, ladies, the last question. Quick, give her a mic. Right, gentlemen. Yeah, there seems to be a, a move at the moment um, for landlords for taking ten farms back in hand, whether that's for their own environmental benefit or part of a bigger picture in terms of an organisation's carbon budget. Um, I think that has potential to have a negative impact on rural communities. Um, plus, it's denying the opportunity for new entrants who don't happen to meet a man in a pub in Bristol with some money. Um, so I just, I just wondered what your thoughts are on that. Well, I don't want to give away the ending of my book, although I am actually about to, but um, Charlie Flint, my uncle, I thought was going to be a brilliant ending because he went on to the SFI pilot, which was extraordinary because everything in it he thought was bollocks. And I thought, this is going to be an example. If you set the framework, you can move anyone. And then the National Trust came to him with a very big check and an NDA and said, how much will it cost to get you to stop farming? And so he's kept a bit of uh, pasture, but 850 acres of arable, which has been farmed since the 1800s, has just been, well, he's, after harvest last year, drilled it up as meadow. So that is exactly what you're talking about. And of course, the National Trust have been given a three million pound HSBC grant to plant trees. Uh, I think that the only way of remedying that, because I agree, I think it's catastrophic for all sorts of reasons, is to keep making the point that we can offer, that farming can offer the same outcome that they're trying to do by taking land out of production. We just need to farm differently. And that's just the case of storytelling, communicating, hammering the same point to those who get to make those decisions. And the reason I think we're making some headway in that is that Rooted has been nominated for a Wainwright Writing Prize. Everyone keep their fingers crossed next Thursday, but not in the nature writing category, in the conservation category. So a book about farming is up against like beavers and woods and seas. And whilst it's won, James Rebanks has won and John Lewis Stemple's won, they've won in the nature writing category. So the fact that a book about farming can be seen as a solution to conservation, I think shows that this is breaking through. I don't have a lot to add to that. To be <laughs> 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 Would you like to ask a question? Who's buying the food that you're producing? And how do you get more people to buy it? Um, well, locals are mainly buying our food. Um, we live in an area where there's very clearly a Welsh community and an incomer community. I would say a lot of our veg does go to that incomer community, but it's changing. This is the interesting thing. We've been doing it for about four or five years, and bit by bit by bit, you know, 
like we used to write people's surnames on the veg boxes, and it, that works really well when we had all these different whatevers, but now they're all called Jones. And so, <laughs> so it's just, it's a really interesting note though, that actually we've had to change the labeling system because we're now selling mainly to real locals. And we're really keen on, actually, we're really keen on trying to rein in as much as we can. Like we four, basically. So we sell 80 boxes, that's what we can produce, like going crazy in a few cafes. Um, and, and within that now, we're kind of bit by bit, we can like drop someone who's further away and we come in a bit closer and a bit closer. Yeah. Um, as for us, it was a, we did a double conversion. So we've converted the land, but we've also converted the man who's been farming that land for many decades. And so far, land easier. But it's given me a really good insight into some of the succession issues that lots of my farming childhood friends have. And one of the things, of course, when you're farming uh, oilseed rate, um, wheat barley oilseed rate rotation forever, is that the trailer just comes and picks it up and takes it away and it goes to a global pile and you do not need to worry about where you sell it. And so for the hand-holding kind of process of conversion, we've used a, a grain trader called Organic Arable and they pick up, they do the same thing, but with organics. Um, but it's, it goes nationally, although it can kind of you know, go up to Scotland and so on. But over the last three years, I've realized I have to sell it before I plant it. Well, I have to know where, I have to think about where it's going to go before I put it in the ground, um, or before Richard puts it in the ground, or before Richard's guy puts it in the ground. And uh, to start connecting with local markets, like we are really lucky to have Hobmadods near us. Suffolk has actually got a really big kind of food connection that goes beyond arable. So that has been, I think, one of the biggest challenges of converting to organic is working out that you've got to get on the phone and sell it. And so some of it is uh, quite hodgepodge and to local farmers with, I don't know if anyone knows Maple Farm, William Kendall's farm. So Mike Matt, I've just sold our old in conversion wheat to Mike Mallet, very happy with that. But it's, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a juggle, selling it all and just getting on the phone and getting a price for it. So thanks very much. Uh, I believe we've got to wrap it up. So uh, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Matt, for, I think, for uh, in touch of feeling words, as we're meant to be doing. Uh, really inspiring, inspirational, and a great way to start today's session. So thank you very much, and uh, please join your hands together. Thank you.